Hello everyone, welcome to Options Discovery on John Lothi News is the Spread. My name is Esma Was, and I'll be your host throughout the series. In this episode, we'll be talking about portfolio margining. Later, I have a chance to sit down with Doug Engman, a senior consultant at Sage Trading, as well as a veteran in the options industry. Doug shares more insight into what portfolio margining is and the influential role he played in making it mainstream in the options industry. Let's start this episode by talking about some of the basics of portfolio margining. Portfolio margining is a risk-based margining methodology used in options trading and other securities trading. Unlike traditional margin requirements, which are calculated separately for each position, portfolio margining considers the overall risk of a trader's entire portfolio. This method allows traders to potentially lower their margin requirements by offsetting risks across different positions within their portfolio. In options trading, portfolio margining takes into account the potential risk offsets between different positions, as well as the correlation between these positions and other assets in the portfolio. By considering the net risk of the entire portfolio rather than the individual positions, portfolio margining can provide more accurate margin requirements that reflect the actual risk exposure of the trader's overall portfolio. Overall, portfolio margining offers traders the opportunity to optimize their capital efficiency by reducing margin requirements while maintaining prudent risk management practices. Portfolio margining has been available for most futures and futures options since 1988. It's now available for U.S. stocks and bonds, forex positions, OCC stock and index positions, and more. Let's talk a little bit more about how portfolio margin accounts differ from strategy-based margin accounts. Strategy-based margin accounts are regulated by the Federal Reserve Board's Regulation T method. Under this method, margin accounts are subject to fixed initial and maintenance percentages. As we just discussed, portfolio margin accounts follow a risk-based methodology that matches margin requirements with the overall theoretical risk of the portfolio. If a trader has a well-hedged portfolio, then their margin requirement can be a lot lower than a strategy-based margin account. This week, we're lucky to have Doug Engman, a senior consultant at Sage Trading, to talk more about portfolio margin and his involvement with popularizing it in the options industry. Without further ado, please enjoy this week's interview. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Options Discovery. Today, I am sitting down with Doug Engman. Doug, can you give me an overview of your background and how you got to where you are today? Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm actually was an army brat. I was born in China, grew up in Japan, Hawaii, Australia, Chicago, and then moved to San Francisco, uh, where I was lucky enough to go to UC Berkeley and then MIT for my master's degree. Um, I then worked at the White House, which was interesting in the early 70s, and was a management consultant in public sector. Uh, but in 1977, my brother, who'd already been interested in securities, joined the Pacific Stock Exchange as a market maker. And uh, I joined him in a partnership uh, trading as market makers on the floor of the Pacific Stock Exchange options floor, which began in 1976. And from there, we uh, traded. Uh, we built a options clearing firm in San Francisco, which was the first options clearing firm west of the Mississippi. Um, actually, it was the only one founded west of the Mississippi. And from there, I got very active in stock exchange affairs. I became chairman of the stock exchange and 1987 uh, for a year um, and ended trading in 1991 um, and ran our options clearing business and related stock uh, execution business, served on the board of the Options Clearing Corporation. I was the first options representative on the National Securities Clearing Corporation in the 90s. Uh, we sold our businesses first to ABN AMRO, and I ran ABN AMRO's global uh, options clearing and execution business, including futures and prime brokerage. Uh, and then we sold our related business to SockGen, uh, and I was head of North American Equities for FEMAT, which is the future subsidiary of SockGen. Um, 
retired, then got back into the business with uh, the acquisition of Sage Trader, which was an introducing broker serving professional traders. Um, and I just sold that business and I'm doing consulting right now uh, in the derivative space. And when you first started out, did you envision yourself being as involved in the options industry as you are today? No, when I first started out, I was a market maker focused on learning how to trade on the floor. And, and back in the 70s, options were a new thing. And so you had to understand what all the, the nuances were of trading options. Um, and then, of course, they we started out with call options and then they introduced put, shop, put options, which confused everybody at first. Uh, uh, but, but no, I... Uh, as I got involved in exchange politics, then I got involved uh, with basically what some of my brother and my traits are is how to solve problems in the industry. And as the options industry was growing, there were a lot of challenges. And, you know, we focused on uh, solving problems for that. And as a result of doing that, you get more involved with the industry. And I know you were just talking about it, but early in, early in your career, you were a market maker for the Pacific Stock Exchange. So what are some experiences from the exchange that stuck with you throughout your career? Well, back when the Pacific Stock Exchange started trading options in 1976, <clears throat> there were only basically three options exchanges. Uh, then there became the fourth. We, we were the fourth and I think the uh, NYSE was the fifth. And back then, the exchanges that started earlier got all the good stocks. So IBM um, and, and all of the uh, Nifty 50 um, were being traded at other exchanges. So we had to take stocks that were less active. And as a result, they didn't trade as often. So at the Pacific, you had to learn how to trade options, not as a day trader, but holding positions. And in holding option positions, you have to understand the Greeks, um, the deltas, the gamma, gammas, and the vegas. And those of us on the Pacific became really very good at understanding values, how to spread, and how to make money uh, based on not buying one minute and selling another minute, but holding the positions until they, uh, uh, when they were out of value and selling them when they were in value. And that's the one thing I remember from the Pacific was uh, um, learning how to trade uh, the values of options. Um, and there were some pretty prominent options traders who took that back East. Blair Hull, for example, was one of the top uh, value option traders uh, or Kessler, uh, they eventually moved to Chicago. My brother and I decided that it, we would rather live in San Francisco than live in Chicago. Um, the only other thing, I, the only thing I, I'd other remember from the Pacific is in 1989, we had an earthquake that closed the Pacific Stock Exchange down for three days, four days. And I was involved with the move of the Pacific options floors to Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, uh, which I've done an interview with John about. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience to transfer uh, the floor trading of one exchange to three other exchanges in basically a day and a half. Well, that is must have been a pretty stressful experience. Um, uh, I'm sure um, that stuck with you. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh, it was an incredible experience, but it showed how the options industry at that point in time, while we were competitors, um, were concerned about the overall general health of the industry. And everyone accommodated uh, the issue that we had, and we were very, very grateful. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit more about your background and how you got to where you are today. I want to talk a little bit more about portfolio margining, its history, and obviously your role in bringing it to life. But before we get into that, can you explain how portfolio margining works and how it's used for options? Well, portfolio margining basically 
changes the way you're required by the Fed and the SEC uh, to carry cash in order to support the risk that you have in your option positions. And under Reg T, which is the traditional way that retail traders have uh, been optioned, uh, they pretty much apply the uh, margin rules to each individual position. And while there are some rules that allow you to offset uh, your uh, margin in related positions, it's very, very limited. So um, if you own stock and you own a put, you have to put up pretty much 50% of under reg T uh, of your, of this value of your stock and 50% of the value of your option even though the put protects the value of the stock as it goes down. Um, portfolio margin takes a different approach. It looks at all of your positions in a related issue and calculates really what the risk is of those positions in a combined fashion uh, based on certain market movements and charges you a margin equal to what that risk happens to be. And so it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, way of allowing people who have offsetting option positions, both longs and shorts, and offsetting stock positions, longs and shorts, um, to have a lower margin because they've basically been able to hedge the risk um, uh, over those overall positions. So knowing this, what kind of options trader would be interested in portfolio margining? Well, basically the, the, the most beneficial aspect of portfolio margin goes to people who are what I would call spreaders or who trade actively, but trade actively both long and short in an issue and have positions that are offsetting because they are able to get the benefit of being margined on the risk in their position as opposed to the total gross value of their positions. Um, now, day traders have some benefit from portfolio margin uh, because the initial margin they have to put up for a, uh, a long position um, is not as much under portfolio margin it, it's not 50% because portfolio margin evaluates your risk down 15%. And so when you sell uh, and buy again, you only have to have maybe a third of the cash that you uh, would need as a day trader. However, the, the SEC and FINRA have rules about how much equity you need to have in your account as a portfolio margin uh, customer. And then certain brokerage houses have minimums as to what you need in order to be able to day trade uh, 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 under a portfolio margin account. And so it's most beneficial to people who have multiple positions. It's somewhat beneficial to people who have uh, are day traders or are long or short on one side of the market. Um, they don't get the greatest benefit, but uh, uh, there is a benefit there. So now that we have um, a little bit more context on portfolio margining and what it is, can you talk more about the history of portfolio margining and specifically your role or the role you played in bringing it to the public? The um, you, you have to understand a little bit of a history. Uh, back when uh, options started to be traded, everything was regulated under Reg T, the traditional way that stocks happen to be margin. And again, margin is the amount of cash you have to have in your account and to be able to support uh, a particular position. And generally it's 50%. Uh, uh, there are some initial margin uh, and the margin requirements change as you hold your stock, but it's a, a fairly high amount. Option traders uh, had an exemption from Reg T uh, because they were all had to be broker dealers. And broker dealers have different 
capital rules. They're not really margin rules. They have different capital rules as to how much money they have to uh, have in their account in order to support the positions that they carry. And um, those are much more beneficial than Reg T, but nowhere as beneficial as what portfolio margin provides. Now, back in the late 80s, the concept of portfolio margin applying to broker dealers that held option positions was called risk-based margins. And risk-based margins back in the 80s were the predecessor for portfolio margin. And at Sage, Sage Clearing, which was the clearing firm that my brother and I founded, we were one of the pioneers in an SEC pilot project in the late 80s to test out risk-based, they're called risk-based haircuts or risk-based margins for option market makers who were broker dealers, of which they all had to be. And we got a lot of experience in understanding uh, how risk-based haircuts, uh, uh, capital requirements for options traders were in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and then that was adopted by the entire industry throughout the 90s for, again, broker dealers who were options market makers. The exchanges felt, the CBO, the Amex, the Pacific, that the same concept could apply for retail customers, people who traded options that were not broker dealers. And they dubbed that portfolio margin. And for a long time, they had discussions with the SEC and FINRA about applying portfolio margin to retail traders. Well, I have to say the SEC in the, in the 90s um, had a fairly conservative staff and were very worried that uh, allowing portfolio margin for retail customers uh, would allow people who didn't really understand uh, options very well um, to take riskier positions because basically under portfolio margin as under risk-based haircuts, um, because your margin is lower, your leverage is higher. And they were very worried about giving retail customers more leverage. Um, that changed in uh, around the mid 2000s. In 2004, the SIBO got approval um, uh, at the SEC to allow portfolio margin under a pilot project. Um, the SEC finally blessed that in 2005. And at that point in time, a broker dealer could under the SEC pilot test project, um, take on retail customers as portfolio margin um, uh, candidates. Now, the reality is that, <clears throat> you know, if you're a Schwab or a TD Ameritrade or whatever, and you have 5 million retail customers or a million retail customers, you were a little reluctant to want to go into that business because if you did it for one, you'd have to do it for all. So the um, at that point in time, we had sold one of our businesses to Societe Generale, the French bank, to its future subsidiary called FEMAT. And we were the equity division of FEMAT. And we had a lot of what I would call professional traders, traders who were not market makers, but traded actively in options technically as retail customers, but we also had a lot of small hedge funds that were trading options as well. Um, <clears throat> when this was approved by the SEC uh, in 2005, uh, my CFO who had been with me since 1980 said, Doug, this is just like risk-based haircuts that we were doing in our older firm, uh, Sage, uh, our former sister firm, you know, for 15 years, we can do this. And so we applied to the SEC and became the first broker dealer brokerage house on the street 
to pioneer portfolio margin. And uh, we were the only ones for about 18 months to test it out. And no, no other brokerage went near it. And we brought on our professional customers and many, many hedge funds uh, into portfolio margin. Um, and that's kind of the primary role we played is we really pretty much introduced it to the industry. I hope you learned a little bit more about portfolio margining. I want to say a special thank you to Doug Engman for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. If you're hungry for more options content, make sure to subscribe to the JLN YouTube channel and check out our social media accounts. Be sure to check out our website, johnlothiannews.com, MarketsWiki, and the John Lothian newsletter for more content.